You're listening to the Electrocasts podcast. This is podcast number 38. This installment of the Electrocasts podcast features Brian McNamara, inventor, musician, instrument builder, and sound sculptor. Brian is based in Australia and records his music under the artist name Cup and Bow. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us yet again here on Eclectrocasts. This is Jeff, and I'm here with my friend Case. Howdy, Case. How are you? Howdy, Jeff. And we're pleased to have a very, um, I would call, multifaceted artist with us this time around. We have Brian McNamara, who uh, goes by, he does lots of things, but he uh, records uh, music and releases music under the artist name Cup and Bow, but he's into a lot of other different things, probably under his name, and we're so happy to have you here today, Brian. Thank you for joining us. Welcome. Thank you for having me, guys. So I have to... Great to to have you, Brian. It is. It really is. You're our second artist from Australia. (laughs) Which is which? Which is pretty pretty good going because you know, um, uh, we've we've had South America, right? Yeah. Uh, we've had the United States and the UK. Uh, we've had Germany, Sweden, Germany, Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Europe is well represented. France. Oh yeah, yeah. I've been. Yeah, we, we've had a f- couple Canucks. 
Uh, <laughs> and later, yeah, later in so. the month, we're going to um, talk to an artist from uh, Vietnam. So that's oh, fantastic. exciting. That'll yeah. be great. Yeah, so we're trying to cover the world. But um, <laughs> speaking of covering the world, um, you have, Brian, you have your music released on Bandcamp, but you have a very strong presence in regard to a lot of other things you're involved with in addition to music. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about where people can find your music besides Bandcamp? How can they listen to you or purchase your music before we start? And then we can get into where they can find some of your other exploits uh, later on in the conversation. So the music's basically divided up. It's mostly Bandcamp, and that's where you find the bulk of, of what I do. But I also use SoundCloud as a bit of a scratch pad for the the stuff that's coming up, maybe a few singles from an album or something like that. So Cup and Bow on um, SoundCloud is also... You put also things out there. under Cup and Bow, but you also Rare Beasts. Are there other monikers that you use? Yeah, I also use Rare Beasts uh-huh. as well. Um, and that, and that uh, often encompasses the instruments that I build uh-huh. as well. So... Um, the cup and bow is kind of the purely the music side and rare beasts is the, uh, handmade instrument side. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I, I really look forward to talking to you a little bit about your handmade instruments. I find it all very fascinating. Mm. Can you tell us where you came up with the name cup and bow for your music? Really? Um, when I first started playing experimental uh, music, I was using uh, this one stringed instrument that I was playing with a bow. (laughs) And um, I was also playing with a plastic cup (laughs) to make noises uh, on the... uh, It was using a a low guitar string, so one of the the, the Uh wire-wound ones. Mm -hmm. And um, so I was using a cup to slide up and down and also a bow to to Uh play the, uh, the music. So probably my first track had had that in it so that's where cup and bow comes from it's, it's a literal did, did, thing did you abandon that instrument after you got going or no i still... have it it is right here i'm i'm um i'm playing this afternoon uh yeah. a, a gig and it is uh it's right oh. here with me right now oh, right wow. oh that's fantastic wow can can you that's just can you, can you make sure we have a picture of of your of that instrument it would be so much fun to share that no problem yeah i'll get that oh, up that would be cool so, so when did this start? Your like was this was this like a goofy thing you did, or like how did you get into to playing? So what I it all I've always liked electronics, and I've always worked in electronic areas. I've always liked pulling things apart, <laughs> and um, occasionally <laughs> I get them back together. Um, but um, it all really started on my daughter's first birthday, and I wanted to make her something uh-huh. really special. So. I built a Mm. sequencer, um, an eight-step sequencer that had four different sounds in it, and the sounds were operated by pushing in Uh big wooden blocks. And um, by pushing in one of the wooden blocks, you put a sound into the slot, and it moved Uh along, and it made a loop of the sounds. And it just kind of sparked some creativity there that I could actually build something without instructions, without anything else other than my imagination. So uh-huh. it, that's, that's where it really started. That's fascinating. Well, that's, you know, I started uh, when I was a kid on those, those same yeah. kind of kits. It just you, you had a book and you got some electronic compo- handful right. of electronic components and mm-hmm. you built them up. And that, that's a great teaching aid to, to get started with electronics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's and, and, and and you're very free with it, right? You're you're not very pre-planned with it, making your instruments. No, it's just it, it's just what happens. I uh, I will just put a circuit together, and uh-huh. it might not be the circuit I thought it was. So, and uh-huh. it just makes a different sound, and I just go with that. Uh huh. Now, in your in your cup and bowl side of your work, do you use your own instruments there, or are your um are 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 those uh, is that like digital or keyboards or it's very much a mix um Mm -hmm. of my own instruments uh instruments that i've circuit bent to change and commercial synthesizers um the only thing i don't use computers or samples from computers it's all from an actual instrument oh okay um 
that I have. But um, yeah, I, I really like at the moment there's a, a drum machine called TR7. Um, TR8, sorry. And um, you can do some fantastic experimental stuff with that because it has this delay and reverb built in mm -hmm. and it just, mm -hmm. it, it kind of makes these great rhythmic popping sounds uh -huh. that I'm really in love with. That's fantastic. So you, you know, uh, the track that we, um, the track that we opened up with before we started chatting, which is Manadata 2, which is coming up uh, from an, an album that you're going to release soon called Of Time Travel, correct? Yes, absolutely. It, it, I, I kind of hear some of that. I, I don't know if it's a blend of your handmade instruments or something analog that was um, manufactured, but it kind of it brought me back to that that early kind of electronic sort of uh, uh, area like Tangerine Dream and um, Jean uh, Michel Jarre, you know, things like that. The, the sounds f felt very much at home in that sort of approach. Yep. And is that part of your influence, your musical influence? A lot of those guys in the seventies? Absolutely. Yeah. And cause it, it, it felt really raw. There was no uh, sample cueing here and there. It was all just, you know, mm. triggering things, you know, mm -hmm. in a, organic fashion and that's kind of where i'm trying to to come from and uh sounds of machines uh -huh. and things like that there's often uh it might be a washing machine or something like that that i record first yeah. and the rhythm of other things ah. follows that machine yeah very interesting. and in that particular track there is the tr8 and that is uh that is doing a lot of the rhythm in there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, also a vocoder right. that um i'm feeding back the I'm taking the output of all the sound and feeding it back in and outputting it as another track mm -hmm. so that it it actually makes its own instrument in the on the edge of feedback there it it switches between right um uh, the frequencies right and it, it it it's a random instrument but it actually makes its own quite mm -hmm. nice sound that's kind of cool did you make the vocoder or is that no that's a, that's cool? another uh commercial commercial okay. unit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the so there's like all these pitch changes happening right and and that yeah, seems exactly. like the, the many of the tracks that we'll be listening to today is you seem to like um enjoy the sort of randomness in in pitches although there is a coherence to it but you seem very attractive to playing around with pitch can you talk a little bit about that yeah, I really like uh, playing with pitch and also the tempo of mm -hmm. the uh, of the piece. In that, I'm kind of mimicking machines changing and the way we change as well. In our, you know, we run for the bus and then we're on the bus and we slow down again. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. it 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 kind of mimics that human machine interaction a little bit. That you will have these changes, the pitch changes coming down, right. and it's. It's not always a step, it's a gradual thing that comes down. Mm -hmm. It might be a heartbeat or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so the, the idea of pitch is to just to to uh, link with the real organic experience of everyday life, right? Uh, that's, uh, exactly, yeah. And, it, and so it, it's, a, it's kind of mimicking, you know, the, the real existence as well. Uh-huh. So, so when I listen to this track, um, I... I, uh, I, I got it, you know, I got an image of animated movie or animated, um, that it would go really well with animation. Um, so, and that's just my experience with that track, but, um, you have started making some videos, uh, experimental videos too, with your new music. So, um, so besides sort of the the daily rhythmic experience of life and the pitch experience of life, what what role does uh, the visualizations play for you in your work? I'm really starting to explore the visual side, and I'm really interested in uh, learning more about that. And uh, that's where those new videos are coming in. And I, for this next album, I would actually like it to be uh, a coherent series of uh, videos to go with it uh, mm -hmm. that are all linked in some way. Um, Fantastic. At the moment, I'm looking, I, I shot a lot of video from a train because I've been yeah. spending a lot of time on the train going to yeah. Sydney and back doing some work. And um, 
that's probably gonna gonna be a part of it. And I I just having that visual there just really seems to um, add to the feeling of uh, the piece. Yeah. And um, it might be that you have something triggered on the change of the rhythm or the change of the pitch, mm-hmm. and that's a visual thing as well. It yeah. just adds mm-hmm. to the way it it, it feels inside right. when you when you mm-hmm. listen to it. So, but you, your process is to go from the music to the visual, right? Not the other way around. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's the music first, and then mm-hmm. go out and uh, and find the video. But it would be lovely to integrate to to have the vision beforehand uh-huh. and say, okay, I want this sound. Mm-hmm. It would go great with this video, and mm-hmm. and they would link mm-hmm. link really mm-hmm. well. I think if you mm-hmm. could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, back in the fifties, Miles Davis, I'm, I'm sure you know, Miles Davis, uh, he, uh, recorded the soundtrack to a French film by looking at, um, still, uh, not stills, but, uh, clips that had already been shot. So he and his, uh, trio French trio that were there at the time watched the part of the film and then created music on the spot based on their what interpretation they felt. of that. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, it is. It's really a fantastic thing. It hasn't been done very, that well, hasn't been popularized that approach. It's it's probably been done by art mm-hmm. art school students for ages, but you know, yeah. nobody gets to see it. <laughs> you <Yeah. know>? So, <clears throat> yeah. so, um, so let, let's let's get back to the idea of rhythm. Um, you you send us a, a a track called "Broken Heartbeat" from your Radius Nation album, um, and I, it's a stunning piece of music. Which uh, it's just eerie how close it sounds to actual heartbeat. And, um, mm-hmm. and can you talk a little bit mm-hmm. about um, how you went about making that track? I'm just very curious. So it's again using the TR8 and this uh, ability to uh, delay mm. the sounds. And its, it's built in delay circuit is like awkward delays, it allows you to have oh. an infinite. Uh, right. Feedback, which is mm-hmm. which is which lets me build up that sound initially, and then as you you control the um, the time, that's when it uh-huh. winds back to the heartbeat and everything mm-hmm. slows yeah. down and the pitch comes down and it mm-hmm. slows down. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's using that mostly that one instrument and another one that I built called Auto Drone, which uh, just makes. A low-level drone. Yeah. It's a background kind of yeah. noise, but what it does is it takes you. You press one button on uh-huh. it. It has a single control, and the timing of pressing that button determines a random sequence of where it's going to go uh-huh. and what it's going to do over so, the track. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, some of the sounds just sound like bird calls. Where where did you get that from? Is that another mm-hmm. random I that too. generator? Or? It, it, it's all it's all coming from that um, that drum machine, and and wow. it's because that it's it's shifting the pitch, and it, it's they're short. And what I'm doing is, because on that particular one, you can turn each drum sound on and off with a volume control. I'm just bringing them up slowly, pulling oh. them down slowly, mm. letting mm. them come into the uh. loop and and fall out of the loop. And it, mm. because it's it's meant to be a drum machine that's used live. Mm-hmm. It just gives me such control over, and it mm-hmm. doesn't really have patterns as ah, such. Mm-hmm. It's more a, a live mm-hmm. performance thing, and it just mm-hmm. lets me put those little tweets in and, and slow them down and speed them up. It, it's a so great you, instrument. You could perform that piece live, and it'd be different every time. It would be different every time. I, I couldn't reproduce that, but yeah, you would get the feeling of ah, of the right. piece. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah, it struck me. I mean, it, it's 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 a sound art piece to me. You know, I, I I very much thought it. I mean, I even thought it was you know kind of almost you know musique concrète in a way. You know, uh, because of all the external sounds and and how they interacted with and how they change over time too, which is to me some of the best uh, features of of ambient music is how how it evolves over time and and how yeah. it changes you. You know, and I found that I felt that a lot with Broken Heartbeat. I mean, I'm just blown away that you get all of this out of this one machine. That's really cool. I think it's on our, our shopping list now. <laughs> yes. Find, find <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and the thing that the, the other kind of elements then in some of your other songs is 
um, they seem like very natural sounds like breathing or conversational or even like ethnic sounds like Aboriginal or, you know, like chanting sounds. Um, so so you, you do all of that from that drum machine. So a lot of it's... A lot of it is also that auto drone that feeds back. So some ah. of that chanting and um, and some of those almost didgeridoo right. sounds right. Um, are coming from that. Just you're controlling the level. You're you're riding the level of the output and the input. Yeah. To to control the sound wow. in and out, but mm-hmm. it's playing itself essentially. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can have a cigarette or something <laughs> while it's doing its thing. <laughs> no, Just you about... no, you have to manipulate it. Oh, you have oh, to. Okay. You, 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 <laughs> you said, yeah. Well, he said it's playing itself. <laughs> no, I, you know, I, uh, in, in a, when we talk about some of your other music there, uh, like in, uh, in the track one gate, there is also one note, one tone that is throughout the whole, Whole song and in the beginning I didn't notice it so much and then it became like more and more and more apparent and that's something that's kind of interesting about your music is that the elements you know uh, your awareness of the elements is not immediately heightened but as you get, get deeper into the song you start to hear more and more and more and you go like oh there is this n- note that I've been hearing yeah. the whole time but now I'm finally aware of it yeah, it's at the same. It's at the same level, but it once you've heard it for two yeah. or three minutes, it starts it, to it gets, just yeah. get in, really get into, yeah. into yeah. the head. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of the time, those are the things that I mix in uh, that are the core of the song. Like uh, one gate, it's a, a whine of a motor uh-huh. just running. Yeah, I'm not sure particularly which motor it is, but that's just that kind of uh-huh. drone sound that that's. Yeah. It's yep. in the yeah. background, and that's the yeah. basis of the right. song and everything. But it has a distinctive pitch to it, that. right? It's not like a fluctuating drone; it just stays one, one pitch. So, so, yep. well, it's almost a, it's almost a noise burst. But we can we'll right, talk about right. that. We'll so, talk about so that let's later. But uh, let's hear let's hear broken heart. Let's do that. Yeah. All right. Sound good? Okay. So this is, uh, by the way, we are talking with Brian McNamara, and Brian is our mad scientist guest uh, for this month on the Electrocast, <laughs> if you don't mind my saying so. He's also a musical artist and does create some great music, and he can be heard on Bandcamp under the artist named Cup and Bow. This is from an album he released called Radius Nation, and the song we've been discussing is called Broken Heartbeat.
Awesome. <laughs> so, um, Great. so I think it's a good time to ask you, um, you know, to talk a little bit about um, your musical instruments that you make. Um, they, they're, I mean, they are functional instruments, but they're also art objects. You use beautiful woods. Your craftsmanship is stunning. Um, you put them together in very interesting ways. Um, the battery is visible often. Um, the circuitry is there. Um, so the circuitry, the circuit board with all the parts on it, is an is a, an explicit part of the of the sculpture. Really, they are really sculptures, aren't they? That you can use as an instrument. They yeah, they're probably. Probably mm -hmm. more, you know, sound art sculptures than than instrument that you can play as well. But mm -hmm. I like to have, I like to be able to see the machine, uh -huh. uh, the thing that makes the noise. And mm -hmm. um, although some of mm -hmm. my things come in in boxes and and, mm -hmm. uh, and are all sealed up, it I like to be able to see the circuit board uh -huh. and the uh, mm -hmm. the thing that makes the sound. I think mm -hmm. that's important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that um, people identify with that. It's the, I think they are appealed. Uh, they it, the the rawness of the object appeals to them. Kind of uh, similar, uh, actually, for me. You know, like when you see a high end turntable. You know, like yeah. when you see a high end turntable. Nothing's yeah. covered up. You know, you see yeah, the belt. You see the belt, and you see the, <laughs> the weights, and you know, the, on its own arm, and all that kind of stuff. But it's amazing. You know, one thing that struck me, um, and I kind of picked this up. I don't remember where I read it about your instruments, but um, you design instruments to be played by people who don't have any musical training, who don't really need to to um, to study the, the not not just study the instrument, but even know what they're doing, and still get something satisfactory or nice out of the instrument when they play it. And I wonder if that has to do with some sort of, um, oh, oh, maybe a way to make it more communal. You know what I mean? Like uh, even in a live setting where people can join in and play these instruments and not have to be inhibited and, and f not feel, you know, um, just self-conscious that they don't know what they're doing. There's a way for them to join in. It's kind of like when you hand a, a child a drum you know, and uh, let him just go at it and ha see how he can join in. Did that have any part of, of, of your creating these instruments at all? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, it comes back to that first instrument I made for my daughter and just seeing her discover that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great to see somebody, to hand something to somebody and for them to just get the sounds out of it straight away and, mm -hmm. and then go into it in a more complicated way, perhaps. But... Mm -hmm. I kind of try to get away from this thing where a lot of instruments have menus that you must go into and, and instructions that you must read. And uh, if I ship out an instrument, mm. I try to make it so that it doesn't Interesting. ship with instructions mm -hmm. so that um, you can discover. It's a part of the experience is to discover how to play it. Mm -hmm. And it should be easy enough that mm -hmm. you can just sit down and play it straight mm -hmm. up without mm -hmm. uh, having to read a manual or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also a beautiful object, you know, that, mm. that would look good in any environment that of people that appreciate musical mm. instruments, a, that, a, a, a living room. And it would even. never have to yeah. be played. Do you, do people purchase your instruments as objects? I think a lot of them are purchased as uh presents uh, for musicians. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of them are just obje objects that, that, are, that are appreciated, uh, that may not get played all the time. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. are a lot of experimental musicians that, that do buy them and, and play them. And I've heard the recordings ah. of them, and that's, it's fantastic oh, to right. hear. That's, that's, so they, um, send, the you, they send you recordings. That's fantastic. They send me recordings and, um, and YouTube videos. They send me links to things like that. And it, it's really one of the most satisfying things is to see somebody take your instrument and even play it in the way you didn't think right. it was going to be played because yeah. they've discovered a totally different way to play yeah. it, which is uh, really nice. My God, it, it takes your art and it makes it part of their life. And uh, it's just, it's just fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it is one of the, it's one of the best things that, uh, that 
that, that you can feel that after sending something out and having somebody just discover something exciting mm-hmm. about it that you didn't know existed. Mm-hmm. So you, you sell these, mm-hmm. um, these instruments through Etsy, right? Yeah, I find that's a, a really good platform because it's, it's all handmade um, objects and um, it just seems to fit uh, the handmade... Um, uh-huh. ethos that I have about how my uh-huh. instruments uh-huh. work and um, there are not a lot of uh, instrument builders on there so I get a um, I get a good deal out of them I think yeah good yeah, good for you man very good. nice that's fantastic. well deserved Absolutely. I, 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 I just think they're beautiful objects you know um, besides that they are functional they're just so interesting so well made you know who, who would ever think to put a, a piece of wood at an angle on a base of something and then mm-hmm. you know um which is already pretty in itself and then make an instrument with it um mm-hmm. so you know you're very unique in that way so I'm, I'm glad it's doing well for you um so you you also play your own instruments right so so yeah. now all your instruments are basically made to do one thing right so you usually have one or two knobs and and maybe one or two switches absolutely yeah they're they're all really quite basic Mm -hmm. um and just do one job so that you don't have to go into menus to change sounds Mm and and things and Mm -hmm. um they might only be you know 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters big so you could have you know half Uh a dozen on a desk and Mm-hmm. and play mm-hmm. them all just for the for mm-hmm. the metrically challenged uh in the world <laughs> it's about four inches by four inches right <laughs> that's me absolutely yeah. i'm i'm he, he hears the number 10 and he thinks it's like fits the whole room right <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> all right so uh, uh, um, so anyway <laughs> no i'm all kidding um <laughs> So, can you tell us a little bit about your sound, sound installations, exhibitions that you uh, that you do? So, yeah, I also um, like to build installations that um, require unusual uh, means of playing things or, or getting sound out of them. So, like a kinetic kinetic sculpture, sort of. Like a kinetic yeah. sculpture, yeah. So, I, I have uh, one that it just goes on a wall at the moment, and there are strings that come down. Mm-hmm. And as you touch the strings, different sounds and uh, effects are created by that. Instrument. So it's interactive, mm-hmm. right? It's not and just to be one looked with at. The ha- yeah. It's interactive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and a, one with a I handle. Suppose, that, yeah. It's a crank yeah, yeah. handle that you turn. And it is actually a motor uh-huh. out of an old printer. Uh-huh. That as you turn it, you, it's a generator and it, it makes sound. And that sound goes into a, a small delay processor. And that... I, I saw a sound. video where you, I, I guess so it was it, you manipulating the handle, and uh, particularly the quick back and yeah. forth uh, made incredible sounds. I mean, yeah, yeah, it really generates quite a sound as you um, as you crank it around, and um, it, it's just yeah, a, a, another take on how to generate sound in a way that you might not think about. Have mm-hmm. you ever considered creating an orchestra with your with those kinds of sculptures and write a piece for it when people actually perform it? I haven't actually. It'd be it'd be an interesting idea if I could get them to to play together. It'd be great. You could be the new John Cage. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. You really that, could. that would be this so is revolutionary, cool. Brian. It really is. <laughs> Look, we have, we have tried to get people to write musicals. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, so we we're go- we're going to encourage you, um, you know, um, and, and the only the only payback we ask is just a little credit line of credit somewhere. But uh, to, to no credit in a line of credit are two different okay, things. Okay, a little yeah. a little <laughs> written, you know, whatever. Um, but I mean, I, don't you think that would be amazing to have, you know, a that live cool performance to, with to... your with those kind of kinetic sculptures? Yeah, that would be really that would be really fun to get them so, together. And, so, if anybody uh, and, uh, who is anybody in Australia is going to be listening to this show, get in touch with Brian and help him start an orchestra. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would be awesome. Fantastic. So, Brian, you have an album coming out. 
Um, and I'm not sure quite when it will be ready, but you shared with us a few tracks for it and you've made a couple videos and the album's called Of Time Travel. And one of the tracks is a two part, uh, suite, I guess, uh, Raft of Endless Darkness and Raft of Endless Darkness 2. What can you tell us about that? What inspired that piece? Uh, I get a, um, there's a very different, the, the two pieces, the two sections of the piece, are very different in their delivery, but they have some continuity in my mind well, the, about them. The, so. word, the word darkness is well deserved in, yeah. to be in the title, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. It's, a, it's quite a dark piece, and it, it's, it's about um, repetitive, the repetition of machines mm-hmm. and how if we were to experience that repetition, it would be a horrible dark place that we were going Mm -hmm. to just doing that one thing over and Mm -hmm. over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's kind of, uh, the title, um, summed up and, and yeah, it is quite a dark, quite a dark piece. It uses the, uh, the one stringed, um, drone instrument. So that's that that cello sound that comes Ah. out, especially in the second part. Yes. That that's played with a bow and, uh, it's just a single string with, um, that I built, it's got a guitar pickup that mm-hmm. runs along the single string mm-hmm. and it, it mm-hmm. makes quite a, a deep mm-hmm. sound. The guitar pickup runs along, so the, the pickup moves? No, it actually, it's fixed, but instead of the pickup, oh. one of the pickup elements being across the string, all six oh. are across one string. Because it uh, at a right angle to you, where it usually is. You turned it 90 degrees. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So the, the, yeah. Four, the four yeah. poles are under the string. So the six yeah. poles, yeah. Oh, and so they're in different... Yeah. Ooh, that is very Isn't interesting. That, and so that gives a... Uh, and I'm using... A, oh, I like that. A, a low E guitar string on there. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. that gives a really deep, mm-hmm. I'm putting it through yeah. a, a pedal that gives uh, some distortion and reverb quite mm-hmm. a bit, mm-hmm. actually. Your intonation and, uh, is very good on that, too, by the way. Your intonation. You. When you're playing any stringed instrument without frets, anyway. And I presume this instrument doesn't have frets. No, no. It's okay, just, so you're uh, using your ear. Fretless. Yeah, yeah. But so, yeah, it's a real, uh, to, to play that piece, it's a real... Um, it's quite an emotional piece, actually. Mm-hmm. You, you really get quite into it when you when you're playing it. Yeah, mm-hmm. kind of picked yeah. up on that melody that breaks through in the second part. I picked up elements of that in the first part, but they were almost like underwater. They were almost as if they were purposefully buried. Yeah. The, so the rhythm of that one is from a circuit bent um, instrument that I built, and that's this. That's that background rhythm that you can hear and it was a toy gun mm. that i picked up at a <laughs> at an op shop and mm-hmm. um you know one of those fascinating things that you can do with circuit band instruments is slow them down to a point where they they make their own sound mm. and rhythm oh. so mm-hmm. that sound is just that toy just over and over and over again playing mm-hmm. in the background oh, that's really mm-hmm. cool i mean that's probably prob- probably really what an oscillator is anyway you know, uh, and so, yeah. you know, so, so, you know, when I was listening to it, <clears throat> to this track, I very much got the image of a, of a procession, maybe a burial procession, you know, but a procession where everybody sort of walks in step, you know, one foot very slowly after the other. And there's a somberness in that, uh, which is sort of supported by, um, you know the the deeper sounds that you I assume are coming from from the string uh, it sounds like chants like a sort of a deep you know um, caverners chanting so that yeah. that comes from your from that string instrument that's wow. coming from the string it yeah. sounds so vocal and it sounds just, like human it, it, voices it, it, it gets really deep and it's going through a guitar um, processor um that's putting the distortion and the um Mm -hmm. and the reverb and some delay in there Mm -hmm. as well and that compresses Mm -hmm. it a little bit as well Mm -hmm. but uh, yeah it's all coming from that um that string and it's just a single string you are very judicious with your use of effects you're not like me i need like more (laughs) effects is better right i don't know you can see a little bit of it right but um, 
uh, and I like to switch effects in different ways and those sorts of things. And, but you are very judicious. You sort of let the instruments speak for themselves, like do their, like you say, let, let, like, like almost like play themselves. And then you tweak some reverb. Uh, reverb and delay seem to be the main effects that you use and some distortion, but you don't use like tremolo or, you know, you, you don't go wild with that. What, 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 how do you make those choices? Where to use effects and, and where to back off of that? It's probably like my recording process is everything is put down in the same, ah. at the same time. So when I record it, I've got a, a little mixer. It does eight uh -huh. inputs at once. Mm -hmm. um, so I normally have four stereo yeah. tracks mm -hmm. and I play them ah. as if I was playing live. Mm -hmm. So I go back and I do levels. Um, I put a little bit of reverb in, as you said, but apart from that, it's almost ah. meant to be a live, uh, a live sound. So I don't play too much with it after that initial uh -huh. kind of live so you, recording. So this kind of like the, the honesty in your work is that uh, for lack of a better word, right? Yeah. 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 Right. You're not like some people like, you know, fix up vocals, <laughs> for <laughs> example, which I've tried to do myself uh, with no success, but, um, but yeah, so it, it remains an honesty and a sort of an in the moment quality to your work. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, I feel it, it, it brings out that in a lot of my work, there's a kind of uneasiness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you can lose that uneasiness if there are too many effects over the top. And it's not always desirable to have that in your work, but I, it's kind of, it's intentional. So I, I like yeah, to yeah. keep that there. Keep it simple that way. And, and, and that way you're, you know, you're yeah, not like exactly. running around tweaking hundreds of knobs. Well, it, it, you know, they're, they're just, I mean, it, it's, it's probably developed over time, Brian, you know, how you apply the effects and how you use them and how, how you, how, how you predict them to behave, you know, the distortion will bring out some overtones and you know, if you have too much reverb, you're going to lose some of that. And, you know, so it's a balancing act. It is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Raft of Endless Darkness. Yeah, Raft of Endless Darkness, part two. We're going to listen to part two. This is just like uh, Mana Data 2, uh, part of the of Time Travel album from Cup and Bow that will be coming up soon. Do you have a release date on that? I don't at the moment. And it's it's the video, the tracks, I have so many of them. It's about cutting tracks down. Yeah. Yeah. And um, But I... I'm looking at the video and I'm looking at turning it into something maybe in, more than an album. And, right. And so, so you want to have time to do that. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. want to have time to do yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. we'll be patient. Well, we're happy to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, we're happy to have this track here on Electrocast. This is Raft of Endless Darkness Part 2.
Brian, a couple of your tracks have part ones, part two, etc. What, what what appeals to you about, uh, you know, uh, that serial, serial kind of sequel nature? Because I do that, too, with my isotherm music. But, you know, how, I wonder what you're thinking. I, I like to have uh, sometimes there's something, there's a sound that I love so much that I can't get it all out in one track. So right. it, it, it carries on. Um, and it might be a feeling that I have that and it may not even be a, a particular link within the sound, but it just feels right to, to link them uh, mm-hmm. title wise like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Some conceptual continuity, really. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It, it, a lot of the time it's a conceptual thing that just mm-hmm. uh, there's something in them. There's something that, that, that links them. So they become a part one or a part two. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So, Brian, I know that you um, have grown up um, make, uh, taking things apart and putting things back together, electronic devices, etc. Did you um, did you do anything uh, kind of conventional with music when you were a kid, like kind of like Case and I did? We were both guitar players and things like that. Did you play guitar or any other instruments when you were growing up? Yeah, I played in, you know little bands with my mates and, uh, yeah. you know, we did lots of recordings and in, um, at the end of high school, we had, uh, we went to a college in year 11 and 12. Mm-hmm. We had this fantastic music teacher who was, you know, part crazy, but she was just the most awesome, inspiring teacher. Um, mm. and she really got us into recording and, thinking about uh, the rests in music being as important as the sounds that you play mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. just things like that that we hadn't thought about before. And uh, she really inspired us to um, to make different sounds. But, mm-hmm. but we, we kept in our bands for a while. It was uh, I Play Guitar and, mm-hmm. and a few other things. It was good fun. Mm-hmm. And the, cool. the start of, of all the stuff that, that we do later on, I guess. Yeah. Do you keep up with any of those guys? I do. Yeah, they're they're still yeah. friends from uh, they're still friends from school, and and we still you know we'll still play, yeah, occasionally together. Yeah, it, it's uh, it's something I really enjoy. So yeah. you're you said you're playing somewhere tonight this afternoon for you? Y- yeah, I'm I'm in Melbourne and I'm playing um, an experimental uh, gig tonight in an in an art gallery. Uh-huh. And um, so yeah, I'm looking looking forward to that. It should be good. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned you brought the family. Yeah, I've got the family yeah. here. My 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 partner's also doing a course in Melbourne as well. So we've kind uh-huh. of linked everything up, and yeah. everybody's here, which is great. So Case and I show up at your doorstep. Okay, <laughs> what sort of music are you gonna? What, we what, might, what, we might what, be yeah, careful. Just to get that drum machine. What? Uh, what <laughs> to borrow that drum machine? What? What music do you play? for us what do you uh not i mean oh, if you want to play your own music that's great but you know what kind of records are you listening to around the house these days i'm you know in my workshop I, i'm always listening to music and it's uh it's mountain goats um mm-hmm. the national mm-hmm. uh mm-hmm. some radio heads mm-hmm. um yeah just it's kind of bands like that it just yeah. I, I really enjoy working to bands like that uh-huh yeah Cool. So Midnight Oil is back together. I saw that they're having concerts, yeah. How about that? Uh, interesting. I've been burning the Midnight Oil lately. <laughs> in, a, in a little while, we're going to ride out with um, a, a track from your, um, yeah. I guess, Oscillator 2 album, OSC 2. Yeah, Oscillator 2. Many, many <laughs> yeah. um, synths have more than one oscillator. <laughs> Uh, so it's called One Gate, and um, it, it's a uh, it's a, a little bit in a contrast to what we just listened to, Raft of Endless Darkness, because it's it's uh, a very danceable tune. When I when I listen to it, I mean, I just find myself bopping back and forth with that song, and I I can see this like a dance company can do like amazing things with this track. That, <laughs> Mm-hmm. It, it's a, it's a fun. It it, it was a yeah. fun track to so, make. It, it it it. So you, you know, well, so earlier we you talked about you know rhythmic 
songs and, 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 you know, and things that are rhythmic in our daily lives, you know, like um, with some randomness in it. But this is very clearly a very strict rhythm, yeah. you know, which invites dancing, doesn't it? So, so can you talk a little bit about that and, and, and maybe the, the role of movement in your music? Yeah, I mean, I, I love dance music, um, but I don't make uh-huh. dance music. And I, I'm not exactly sure why, but because um, mm-hmm. people do it so well. And, and, and the, the, the stuff that I listen to is sure. just awesome. But, um, yeah, that just something about uh, the sounds that I was creating there do make you want to move. It, it, it's a... Yeah. It's a... Just that rhythmic thing, I guess that that's being built up in one game. But also the the, the driving mm-hmm. sort of voice sound, right? The whir, yeah, whir, yeah, that's right? it. Uh, because because it's not a dance tune that's based on a on a kick, right? A drum kick. It's not like that at all. Well, the kick is very it, syncopated, so it's it doesn't give you yes. something to follow. No, no, that w- right. it, it, that that way in that way that we're used to. Well, but, but the whole piece is syncopated. Right. All the parts are syncopated. Right. They're they're not all lining up. Right. So and that makes you move along, mm-hmm, you know, like mm-hmm, sort of almost like mm-hmm. a undulating yeah. moving. Right. Yeah. Like like a horse, like a horse, like you're the way you are on a horse is not a steady forward motion. It's a it's, it's a, a circular combination forward of, motion. Of, yeah. of several rhythms. Yeah. And that's kind of. Yes. What, so the basis of this one is uh, a motor mm-hmm. uh, that's moving again. Mm-hmm. Um, and also in the background, there is a truck trucks pass by my house a lot and uh, when I'm trying to do uh-huh. field recordings I sometimes <laughs> pick these up and um, it just uh, it got in there and, I, and I, I decided that that would be a part of it as well so it has uh, it has trucks and uh, and motors and then on top of that is this uh, is this rhythm again created by that uh, TR7 right. Right. drum machine right. yeah yeah that's a little miracle tool <laughs> I have I you know, didn't buy it for that purpose, thinking that I'd mm-hmm. be using it for things mm-hmm. like that. But it, uh, it's been a fantastic tool, actually. Yeah, so uh, earlier we talked about this idea of drone, uh, and and this track has a pers- also, you know, so I, I don't think this is dance music, but it's danceable music, right? <laughs> yeah. And Right? And I mm-hmm. think there's a big distinction. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, and, and dance music, there's lots of people... You know, particularly from the disco era and swing, and you know they know how to do that. But this is this is experimental music that's danceable, and I think that's very interesting. Um, it is my favorite track of of the ones you have shared with us. So, um, so there is this underlying tone which creates this urgency, <laughs> which I find very interesting. So, can you talk a little bit about the the choices that you make compositionally? In, in one gate? So, yeah, so the base of it is that uh, that motor sound uh-huh. and the occasional, it's very hard to hear the, the, the truck coming in and out as well, but it kind of, it's forming the basis of that mm-hmm. rhythm and then it's got the vocoder on top of that uh-huh. very at a very low level mm-hmm. and it's actually doing the triggering of the other... Uh sounds and that's probably I got lucky with that because it's formed a really uh, you know that experimental sound with the dance yeah. mm-hmm. rhythm mm-hmm. it's just it was probably mm-hmm. more luck that mm-hmm. that turned out to it's, it's ca- to be a pleasant yeah a pleasant sound uh-huh. to the it, ear yeah it's kind of kind of side chaining it almost really absolutely yeah. and I was the side chain I was using um, from the vocoder right. into into ah, the TRA yeah. on that exactly okay so that's part of it okay. yeah so, um, great. I wanted okay. to, sorry, well, I wanted to ask you about the title, um, because you can also use a gate to create a rhythm, right? By, um, just uh, gating out parts, right? Like certain, certain volume levels. So why is it called one gate? It's part oh. of that side oh. chain as well. I, I think of that as a gate because right. on, on this machine, you can just, you can run your finger along it and ah, and okay. just chop out parts of, of mm-hmm, the sound. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I was doing that in it, and that's yeah. part of what's forming the sound as well. So uh, it just stuck in my head that I was using the gate to, to make 
in that fairly unusual way to make the rhythm. Okay. So okay. that's where the one, that's the one gate that, that produces the sound. Yeah. So, so Brian, um, be, before we ride out on, on um, one gate, my favorite track, um, uh, is there anything that we should have asked you or anything you wanted to share that we didn't ask you no, about? No, I think you've, you've covered a lot of what I do, I think. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so then let, you know, let me say that um, this has been a great privilege talking with you. I, I hope you'll have a wonderful experimental gig this afternoon and, and many more to come. We're tremendously looking forward to uh, your new album and we will thank help you. you promote it. Uh, thank you so much for taking uh, time out um, to talk mm -hmm. with us. Very much appreciate it. This has been a long uh on our, our you've been on our wish list for a long time and we finally were able to uh, find some time to talk with you so thank you so very much you're a wonderful person and it's been great spending some time thank with you, you. thank, thank you. you and thank Absolutely. you so much for having me on it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be on your show thank you great great it's good to have thank a new you. friend thank you <laughs> yes absolutely Absolutely. So uh, we've been talking to Brian McNamara and uh, Brian is the mastermind behind Cup and Bow. And remember, you can go to uh, cupandbow.bandcamp.com and sift through his uh, pretty extensive. He's got uh, I'm looking at the site now. He's got uh, about nine, nine yeah. albums. Oh, 12 uh, yeah, full length albums there. there. Some of them mm -hmm. are, are based on individual yeah. instruments. Yeah. Um, uh, Fully, but so, yeah. yeah, it's about 12 there. So everybody go check it out. Yeah. Go check it out. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. And uh, we're going to ride out on the track called One Gate from the Oscillator 2 album. So thanks, Brian, for joining us. Thanks, Case, as usual. And uh, hopefully, uh, thanks for listening, everybody. So uh, take care, and we'll thanks, see you on the road. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you very much.